and, and it's the industry that needs to take goals seriously, not the, the crowd. Uh, because I've seen it with our artists that, you know, you see other girls just in awe, as well as the men, that, you know, these, the, these are their favourite DJs. Um, I, I think that's what's maybe standing in the way and one of the reasons. And, and I don't know, like when I was a kid, I, I hope things are different now, but boys with technology, even if it's a video game, you didn't want to let your sister play. You know, it's like, no, I'm playing, you know, and it's the, this whole kind of male ego overwhelming um, all, all sorts of things. I mean, creativity is, is genderless, isn't it? You know, and I've met so many beautiful, or, or we, we've supported so many beautiful girls that make beautiful music, yet here we are with you telling me it's 2%. That's kind of blowing my mind, actually. You're listening to The Mission Makers Show, a podcast that inspires humans to get into the mindset of success. My name's Farah Nanji, and I'm the founder of a business in the motorsports industry that explores leadership lessons from things like Formula One. I'm also a DJ and music producer in the underground electronic scene and a public speaker on key topics like resilience, building high performance teams, overcoming learning difficulties and stimulating creativity. And to tie it all together, I love writing thought-provoking content as a journalist for these industries which are so unique in themselves. On this show, I'm sitting down with some of the most inspiring and driven people I've met around the world to talk about their processes, their failures, the lessons they've learned and how they are truly making an impact for this world. So it's the final episode of season three of Mission Makers and I'm beyond honoured to close this season with an absolute legend in dance music today, Lee Burridge. A visionary, a pioneer, a disruptor, Lee's name has been synonymous in defining a melodic, melancholic, floating sound that has exploded in popularity with his brand All Day I Dream, amongst many other highly notable achievements. This week's episode dives deep into the mental pressures of performing consistently at such a high level for three decades straight, his feelings about the industry, as well as his advice to up-and-coming artists and so much more. But just before we begin, if you're interested in some really cool rewards like virtual DJ lessons, the chance to ask our guests questions and exclusive merchandise, head over to patreon.com forward slash mission makers to check out how you can access these exclusive rewards. And thank you to all of you who've been writing into us and subscribing to the show. It really makes a difference. So don't forget to hit that subscribe button if you love the content we're making here at Mission Makers and help us take the show to the next level in season four. Hey Lee, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? Hi, doing quite well. Thank you. My voice is a little scratchy from a very long weekend, but uh, otherwise good. Yeah, absolutely. It was your birthday, so belated wishes. Um, and yeah, such, a, such an honor and a pleasure to have you on Mission Makers. I'm genuinely so excited for the next hour ahead. Um, and as with a lot of our interviews, we like to kind of go back into the beginning. And um, so starting off with our sort of intro section you're you're a master and innovator of the electronic uh, electronic sorry sorry genre uh, with nearly 40 years of experience in the industry under your belt which is absolutely incredible um so do you remember like the first kind of moments that you really discovered your calling that sort of lightning bulb moment and did you ever dream no pun intended that you know it could it could get to this sort of level I definitely had no idea I was uh, I was a postman actually and um it's one of my first jobs after school, I decided not to go to university because I had no idea what I once wanted to study. Um, so I thought I w- would work for a summer um, and sort of had this parallel of staying out until two or three a.m. and then getting back up at four a.m. and going deliver- and delivering the post. But I was doing uh, weddings and kids' birthdays and then um, nightclubs very early on. And, you know, I, there was no real sort of global music industry that I knew of. I'm living in the countryside in Dorset. So um, I had no sort of nothing to dream other than wow I I love playing music but rewinding to when I was less than 10 music was always the thing that compelled me the most out of anything but I had no sort of nobody to mentor me or guide me into I don't know becoming a musician or you know it's just a genuine passion sitting on uh, my bedroom floor on a Sunday night with a little tape recorder recording the charts and just listening to music over and over and wanting to know the lyrics and it's sort of 
ended up being um, a, a DJ career just due to a guy called Steve Smith, who played in my father's pub in 1982, the exactly a year before I did my first ever gig. Um, so it just sort of happened to me. Um, but as soon as I was given the opportunity to do it full time, which was somebody offered me a job in Asia in 1990, that's it. I leapt at the chance. Um, and I think when I moved back to London in 1997, so after six years in Asia, that's when it really started making sense. And I started to see a wider industry and it was really something I was, oh, wow, I want to do this. You know, I want to be able to travel around England actually was my <laughs> first asp aspiration, which, you know, I, I achieved obviously. And then after that came everything else. Yeah, I mean, talking about Asia, I mean, you you're one of the the sort of spearheads for forging the rave scene in in Hong Kong, and uh, and I know you are sort of behind a lot of the full moon parties, but back in the pre social media days, which I can imagine were um, completely wild and different. Um, so this must have been crazy. What does it sort of mean to know that your legacy it's not just confined to your sound, but also culture, idea, and um, and the liberation that I feel that you've uh, you've really inspired. I haven't really ever thought about legacy um, until the last 10 years. So I think back then it came from a very innocent and naive place I, and also a lot of luck and being in the right place at the right time. Um, and I think I was just doing what I believed in and what I loved, which was sharing music with people. Um, I think after the initial sparks of thinking, actually everywhere you went back then you went, wow, this would be a great place for a party. So that was uh, clubs in Hong Kong, beaches in Thailand. And, and of course, I wasn't the only person, but I was really in the first wave of people really doing them, these things in these places. Um, but I think with Legacy, it just sort of, it just trails behind without much thought. In 2007, 2008, I started really wanting to, I actually always wanted to help other people, but I realized that I could help other people. Uh, just because I think my career was starting to establish itself in a place that you can really sort of do more than just things for yourself. And All Day A Dream itself came out of the desire to create something new that didn't exist in the space, um, as well as support younger talent that maybe not uh, don't have the opportunity, uh, the understanding, the experience, the connections to move forward from where they are. You know, there's a lot of sort of floundering out there of like, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to do it. And I think nowadays you can maybe watch a YouTube tutorial on how to become a DJ or something, but back then, not so much. Um, and a lot of the industry itself isn't completely supportive of a broader range of artists. They find one and that's it. They develop them. So um, looking back now, I mean, I guess legacy is just for me, it's the opportunity to actually help still help younger artists and hopefully with all their dream as a platform that will outlast me you know hopefully i'll be around for a long time but it will be there as something you know i kind of created to be able to you know just nurture younger talent and give them the opportunity to do the thing they love the most as well what does that what does that journey look like if someone is in that position where they, they they're lucky and they get sort of taken under your wings what what do, what what can they sort of expect from you i think it's not just me, it's actually the, the community that I've built around the idea. They're so friendly and supportive, so they will help with, you know, tiny details of production or the broader thing with production. You know, they may sort of say, no, 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 you know, start with this. So you have a very, you have a great network of um, various sort of different directions of music that's right there for you. Um, and when it comes to, like sort of playing out the events obviously are on a global scale at this point um especially in the us there's quite a lot of weight to being part of the family so i may book a, a new artist for a few of the key events and a lot of the time they they really just come on board at the beginning we have a kind of it's not a trial but it's sort of a apprenticeship of sorts mm -hmm. So, I, I mean i've done it myself you know it, it's not always the best thing in the world to play the warm-up set but it's that whole thing of being, oh, who's this new name? Somebody new. And then after that, you know, after they've sort of come through the door, they play, you know, I also put um, smaller artists on to close out parties. I've never really been hung up on that whole idea that we have to put the biggest DJ at the end. You know, it's, 
in, in fact, I kind of like going the opposite direction and being in the middle and almost because I because I believe in them. So it really is a it's just a place to um, show their talent and and it's a place to release their music and it's a sort of family of artists to support them myself included um so yeah that's kind of where we're at awesome thank you for for giving us that uh, that overview so the meaning of your name lee is actually meadow and often when you think of a meadow it's reminiscent of peace and tranquility um has this sort of meaning ever had any sort of um resonance in your life um do you think it might even translate to your music it's an interesting question, actually. Um, I, I looked up my name once as well, and it, I think it's something like it's the sheltered side of something. So, and, and I've always really been really interested in names. Like, does, does a name affect your, you know, your path through life? Because if I was called mm. Steve Burridge, would I be tougher? Or <laughs> Roger Burridge, would I be a porn star or something? <laughs> um, <laughs> but I, but I, I don't know. I mean, because I don't think I ever really thought of the or, or looked up the the meaning but uh, perhaps yeah mm. sort of uh, I'd like to think it is yeah I'd like to think <laughs> it's sort of the the stars have aligned and my parents decided to call me that and it's you know created this wonderful gift of a path for me definitely um, it's actually a question we love to ask our guests uh, in the in the first part of the interview and and surprisingly a lot a lot of people aren't aware but in in some weird way it's it's had some sort of subconscious you know they've kind of Bit, bit, bit embodied that that meaning so that's uh, that's a beautiful um uh, meaning and message and talking of names I mean um I'm curious then to know like do you when you write music do you um have a name already like for your tracks or does that come a lot later in your creative process do you ever I'm going to ask you a question do you ever sort Ooh. of say great band name you know when you say two words together mm -hmm. um I write down so many uh names that I think are great names for tracks and mm -hmm. that used to be part of the process which is actually we would try to write a track to the name but it never worked out and then mm. we tried to um sort of like look through the list and think does this one suit this track and that never kind of worked out you know maybe one in ten times so not nowadays really we kind of come up with the name how it felt during the journey of making the track something always just comes up you know mm. but Sometimes there's a leaping off point, you know, mm. where we look through the list and it sort of sends us in a direction and mm. that's the working title, but it never really ends up being the name of the track in the end. Mm. Yeah, same for me, actually. I have a, a little Evernote document with with all random names I think of. And um, yeah, but in the end, it kind of just just comes later, I guess. But um, yeah, so you went from, as you mentioned, you, you grew up in Dorset um, and I think it was a, a small village um, environment and then you went obviously to the bright lights of Asia and there's a huge change in, in so many ways. So um, I'd love to know how your roots shaped you and um, also how you dealt with that change, you know, being a young, young man and kind of going from, from there to, to, to Asia as well. Uh, I mean, there's obviously in um, villages, there's a much smaller mentality to the wider world than there is if you grow up in a city, for instance, because mm -hmm. you're obviously um, exposed to less sort of diverse group of people. However, I grew up in a pub, so and it was very summer oriented holiday kind of uh, based village where during the winter, there's 50 people in the village and during the summer, you know, it's kind of a lot busier. So I think um, I, luckily enough, I'd sort of from 12 working behind the bar, don't tell the authorities, um, I had actually got to meet, learn to communicate with, um, you know, all sorts of people, interesting people, you know, and you learn the social skill of small talk and um just seeing different people um that came through but when i went to hong kong the thing was i sort of discovered really quickly that hong kong itself was like a giant village <laughs> so everybody kind of stayed in very small pockets in the city um there was quite a divide between chinese culture and western culture um so the westerners lived in these you know few areas and went to these few areas to shop or to go to the bars um so it was very familiar in some ways and um yeah I was lucky enough that I sort of managed to feel very at home instantly it was a very welcoming city actually mm -hmm. very safe as well so my roots kind of aligned with how it ended up being in my 20s in Hong Kong but it also gave, gave me the opportunity of utter freedom. So the watchful eyes of 
I guess, what you consider to be authority, be that parents or the police, weren't really honest. So, <laughs> um, yeah, there was a lot of freedom. There were a lot of mistakes. There was a lot of crazy, um, but, you know, I navigated through it okay. And really only when I moved, again, I said I moved to London in 97. That's when there was this sort of, I'm glad I had the buffer between Dorset and London of Hong Kong. It sort of trained me into really being able to live in the city, uh, mm. but in a gentle way. And then, you know, London's quite a hard city to live in if you don't know anybody, which is, you know, I went back with a couple of friends um, and that was it, you know? And so I don't think I would have survived uh, with my roots being eep in, uh, in Dorset without being able to sort of apply them gently and grow through Hong Kong. Mm, definitely. And what are your thoughts uh, on the London scene? I mean, I think that I'm old and I don't really even know what's going on. <laughs> uh, you know, no, because we, you know, we always make what we're doing about ourselves. The London scene to me, for somebody that's sort of in and out of London is it's breathing in, breathing out. You know, it's, there's always things developing, always interesting things. And I think it still has an edge and it's wonderful. And it leads the, uh, the way in, in the world a lot of the time when it comes to music and things that are happening um you know there's a long time when germany kind of overwhelmed uh the uk and especially london in terms of what was at the front you know it came up through uh underground clubs and it became so popular globally but london's always there you know it's never going away there's always amazing creative young people doing so much in that city because it's london you know and it's uh, it's never going to change but you know I wish I knew more <laughs> yeah no definitely I think uh, you know part of it is it's also governments and uh, not supporting or enabling the the creative scene in in the UK or, or London to really thrive um, <clears throat> versus a place like Berlin so talking about you know all day I dream naturally you know you created this label and party series in 2011 and it's it's created this incredible community of its own within electronic music um, so take us through the concept of, of, of All Day I Dream and how it's sort of evolved to you and, and the community uh, over time. So I guess, I mean, I'll take you right back. Uh, and, and, I've, and I've obviously uh, said this before in interviews, there was a, and actually previous to this, so the minimal was huge and it kind of had, had uh, replaced where I was at. I, I was doing okay. Uh, you know, we, were, we had a residency at Fabric um we uh, this is alongside Craig Richards I mean he was the resident and Tyrant the event that we were doing had a residency uh so I was there um uh, once a month and we were playing kind of wonky early tech house before tech house became more form formulaic and we were playing breakbeat and we were playing techno and we were playing all sorts of things and it was this beautiful muddle of music that wasn't really happening anywhere else and we absorbed the west coast sound from the US and uh, Terry Francis, Wiggle, all this kind of stuff. And it was, it was beautiful. And then uh, Minimal sort of just kept growing and growing and growing. And where we were at became less relevant, not irrelevant, but just less. And for me, it was one of the biggest dips I've ever had in my career. Mm -hmm. So panicking, I moved to Ibiza and I took on this sort of like, I, I need to join somebody else's bandwagon, which I've never really been like that in my life. And it, and it didn't really last very long in my head. So it's hanging out at DC 10, trying to sort of schmooze, you know, just doing all the wrong things when I look back now. Um, and then suddenly I just, I was at an after party. Somebody was complaining about what I was playing, one particular track. And, and I just sort of had this spark where I was like, what am I doing? I'm trying to sort of fit square peg round hole. So um, I went back and I just started thinking about, okay, what do I really want to do? What do I believe in? And I'd started finding very disparate labels with the odd track, which had mel melodic elements in it. Over a year, I managed to gather enough of those together and form a mix, which became called, uh, was called All Day I Dream of Her. And I just felt compelled uh, with this music. So I just was searching and searching and searching for it all the time. Um, and then I started giving the mix to, to uh, girls, actually, because it felt like, I also started noticing there weren't enough girls going to dance music events just to sort of gauge the response. So there was a lot of passion and love for the mix and, and it sort of kept growing from there. 
Then resident advisor asked me to do a mix, which I gave them that particular mix. And it was also very well received. And I think maybe six months later, I was at an after party in Mexico. Uh, I forget who was playing, but the music was really oppressive. And the, you know, a lot of friends were there. And I just sort of said, do you mind if I play some music? So bear in mind, prior to me playing, everybody's sort of sitting back, eyes rolling, you know, just what's going on. I put on, I started playing all this music. Everybody stood up, everybody's smiling. And it became very communal. And, and, and that really stuck with me. So again, fast forward another few months, I, I played at a festival, Lightning in a Bottle in the US. And again, there was a very specific energetic sound. And I was like, you know what? I'm not going to do that. I'm going to really like take a risk and play this music. So I played three hours of it and it was the most trippy, happy, joyous, beautiful like experience. I had my hair standing up on my arms and... So that's the, that's the foundation of the idea of All Day a Dream. It came from all these different experiences and, and gathering this music. And, and then I just decided I need to do this. I, I was doing fairly well in New York, but New York itself, every promoter was cutting a corner. Either the sound wasn't good, there was no production, there weren't enough girls at the party, just stuff. So uh, I, I'm like, okay, I need to make some changes right now. And I thought I would take a risk. I've never been a promoter before. And I decided to put on All Day I Dream. Luckily, I had the help of friends uh, at the time who really were also key in making the event happen, uh, both from the production and sort of reaching out to people. Because your ego as a DJ, you like to think that everybody is in the nightclub for you. However, I think if you went around and said, who's DJing tonight in any nightclub, there's also going to be people that are like, I don't know, you know, they just they just go there. And, and it's not like they don't enjoy it, but they're not so in the scene that they, they, they follow the artist. So I had that realization about two days before the party. And I was like, oh, my God, how many people are going to come? Are we going to lose loads of money? Uh, but luckily, you know, across our networks, we managed to get 350 people at the first party. Mm. But I also decided that it was all about continuity. So I did one party every month that summer for four months. So we went 300 people, 500 people, 700 people, 800 people on a roof for 500 people. So totally dangerous. Um, and, and, and that was it. I just I, I knew in, in at my core that this idea was going to work out. And, and I also sort of made this sort of intention at the beginning, I just want to make people smile. And it's still actually the, the intention for All Day a Dream. It never really uh, changed. And of course, you know, everybody's supposed to start a label before you start a party, but I started a party before I started a label. Um, and the label itself, luckily enough, I crossed paths with Matthew DK, who is still to this day, you know, one of the most talented producers that I've ever gotten to work with and ever met. And Matthew never even came to the events, but he shaped the idea of the music from the words, the descriptions, and the the mix itself from mm. a few years prior to that. Amazing! Thank you so much for taking us through through that journey and talking about sort of the first the first parties. What what was it about New York that inspired you to kind of kick it all off uh, in New York? Really, a mixture of um, as I said, it was kind of my most uh, popular market at the time also there's um there's a burning man tie-in there's a lot of people in new york that go to burning man so i felt like I could tap into that community itself uh i liked the idea of doing an outdoor event in a more kind of blunt brutal space but giving it a feminine edge with the decor uh because i like the kind of juxtaposition of the the, the hard and the stop the light and the dark um i but mainly i just think i i think it was kind of the place that i felt i in europe if i'd launched in europe i think it's this there was so much going on and so many established brands and such sort of love of minimal that i felt like new york was the place and also the us itself apart from maybe the more commercial end of dance music as a country, it never really had a sound. And I, I had this intention that to give it some sort of sound, you know, it's not across the board for everybody and it's still an underground scene. But um, if you think back to Detroit techno or house music out of Chicago, 
Hasmut Music Gap Chicago is the music I found in Dorset in 1986, end of 86. So it, it's not like it didn't go anywhere. But in America, it took a long time for dance music to really to spread out across the country and, and have some sound where you could have an event, easily have an event with thousands of people in all sorts of different cities. Mm. And, I, and I felt that if I started in New York, I mean, New York is, you know, l- alongside London, it's one of the most important cities in the world for many, many reasons. So it carries weight. And I always kind of figured that if we can make a, a successful event in New York, that also will carry some sort of weight in, you know, if we come back and import back into Europe. So there was a kind of, there was an uh, awareness that that's, those were my intentions. That's what I wanted to do. And luckily it worked out. <laughs> Definitely. As they say, if you can make it in New York, you can make it anywhere. Um, <laughs> so talking about feminine energy um, and, you know, on the dance floor, obviously it being unbalanced back then, but you know, here we are 2021 and there's still only 2% of music producers being female. So um, clearly, you know, there's still a long way to go. Um, uh, what, what do you think the sort of major blockages are? Hey you, we hope you're enjoying today's episode. We're on a serious mission here to create one of the world's best podcast series and we'd be so grateful if you could support us in any way by becoming a patron of the show. There's a tier to suit every level, from early bird tiers where you get downloads to all my music with some super cool ninja stickers, to our VIP mission maker tiers where you get epic rewards like exclusive footage that never gets aired, the chance to submit questions to our guests with signed copies of books from them, DJ lessons, one-to-one coaching and a whole load of super cool ninja and mission maker merchandise. You can start supporting us for less than what it costs you to fill up your car for a month by simply heading over to www.patreon.com forward slash mission makers. Thanks for listening and I hope you enjoy the rest of the show. I didn't know that. That's really sad that it's only mm. 2%. Um, I guess maybe it's uh, role models. I mean, nowadays it seems there are more role models, uh, female role models in music. Uh, I guess... Nina Kravitz, Emily Lenz, Charlotte DeWitt, Cassie, Miss Kitten, Nicole Mudabar, you know, and I think that in, even in All Day a Dream, I've actually since the beginning tried to encourage uh, female artists. Um, but bear in mind, over 10 years, really, I've only discovered four that fit with our music. Um, I Most of the demos I get are actually you know disproportionate to guys and yeah I mean I guess without more girls out there you know not as a token because it's a girl you know as some kind of novelty with with when when it's somebody that can be taken seriously uh, and it's the industry that needs to take girls seriously not the the crowd uh, because I've seen it with our artists that you know you see other girls just in awe, as well as the men, that, you know, these the, these are their favorite DJs. Um, I, I think that's what's maybe standing in the way and one of the reasons. And, and I don't know, like when I was a kid, I, I hope things are different now, but boys with technology, even if it's a video game, you didn't want to let your sister play. You know, it's like, no, I'm playing, you know, and it's this, this whole kind of male ego overwhelming um, and also, all sorts of things. I mean, creativity is is genderless, isn't it? You know, and I've met so many beautiful, or, or we we've, we've supported so many beautiful girls that make beautiful music. Yet here we are with you telling me it's two percent. That's kind of blowing my mind, actually. Mm. So, yeah, yeah I mean, not enough role models. So come on, girls. <laughs> Definitely, it's it's food for thought, and. Um... You know, it, 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 and perhaps some some positivity in this is um, the GCSC music curriculum now um, has music production and DJing as forty percent of its grade um, for music. So I, fi- I find that absolutely amazing that that push has happened, and and perhaps it's it's still you know we were talking off air about racing, but you know generation away, but but nonetheless having those role models like you say Nicole, who's obviously you know um, broken so many um, doors down to kind of to to, mm. to be where she is, um, and the rest, you know. Uh, definitely uh, agree so um obviously we're speaking sort of coming hopefully off the back of the pandemic so just curious to know sort of how was the summer for you like how did it feel getting back to to the, to the stage and and also how was the lockdown for you I mean did you did you did you actually thrive in 
having a bit of a break from a crazy touring schedule and stuff like that. Absolutely. I realized that quality of life isn't work. <laughs> you know, I love what I do, but um, everything got rolled up into this endless kind of uh, conveyor belt of going and traveling and playing and sleeping and leaving. And, and, and you know, as I said, it's great, but being given that sort of time to step back and realize there are other things in life other than just playing music to people. It's really, really healthy, actually. Um, I think for everybody's mental health almost as well, you know, we, and for the, the, the appreciation of, we took everything for granted, you know, that everything's just going to be there forever. And out the other side of it came uh, going back to playing events and clubs. I mean, I was a little trepidatious to start with uh, because of course there are still people out there that are very, very nervous to, um, crowds gathering en masse and you know dance music isn't the highest priority thing for people to uh integrate back into their lives however with the way people struggled through the pandemic um i think a lot more mental health issues came up and the idea of being part of and sort of joining in with a community of people that you resonate with is is actually kind of important because i think the detachment really kind of hurt people in many ways um but it was interesting going back and seeing this thirst in people for dancing and just being around each other you know so some of the best parties i've ever played were this year because it was almost like it had never happened ever and this is people's first ever experience uh going to events and dancing to music yeah, I mean, wow, what a what a crazy, crazy time. And, and talking about mental health, I, I read that uh, you and Jamie Jones have recently announced a new partnership with um, a music meditation app called Maya. Hope I'm saying that right. Um, yeah. And the, the mission is part of their Music Mind Journey series, and it seeks to interweave uh, meditation, music and mental health. Um, so now you and many of our listeners will, will probably strongly relate to um, electronic music's ability to instill a feeling of deep presence and interconnectivity, um, similar to the feelings of meditation. So um, talk to me about your journey uh, with this and what you guys sort of hope to, you know, achieve and um, yeah, what, what the whole vibe is about. I mean, May is an interesting new take on the kind of wellness and meditation uh, through music um, idea. Because I think in the past you would really think, if you were thinking meditation, you would think ambient music or gongs and, you know, sort of sustained voices. <laughs> um, but we obviously, as you said, have experienced being on a dance floor and there's a certain hypnotic nature to repetitive beats or uh, melodies. And I mean, I mean, I myself and most other people, I think time just disappears and you're like, what just happened? You know, a whole night goes by you were there but you weren't so i think they they they've decided to kind of explore um using frequency using repetitive beats um across a few different djs and just change the way uh meditation really is viewed in the world because i think also it can have that sort of stigma of being oh it's, you know, it's hippies whatever people are meditating i myself actually started using meditation to help me cope with that anxiety that I, I no longer have the anxiety. I had crippling anxiety at times. And, mm -hmm. and really it was just, I think, overwork and uh, excess and, um, you know, sort of just being, going too fast. Um, and and I, I started with transcendental meditation. And whereas before I was throwing Xanax at it. So, you know, putting a lid on a pressure cooker, you know, it's great for a moment, but it's still in there. and TM had kind of like just literally in the first two sessions I've never had anxiety since then which I'm glad that I'm a success case and I always try to sort of talk to anybody else that's going through um, that those kind of anxious feelings and point them in the direction of this but um, Mayor itself is trying to um, just bring more people towards meditation because it's not only giving them uh uh, in, uh, chants or um, people speaking, you know, like uh, using sort of language to hypnotize beats, which seem more familiar, certain dance music tracks. There's also more traditional stuff on there. There's uh, 
healing frequencies. There's all sorts of things going on. So yeah, they, they just approached a few DJs to kind of, uh, rather than bolting us on, we're actually, I think the music that we, uh, we play and we provide to them is actually the right end of dance music at the moment. Uh, you know, you can go for a walk, put on your headphones, uh, you know, walk around the park, eyes closed, eyes open and use it to kind of just take a moment to yourself and stop those, you know, like thousand thoughts that are going through your head all the time. Mm, no, definitely. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, yeah, it's, it's super interesting and particularly in, in the line of work that we're in, you know, obviously it's such a fast paced life. It's crazy. It's so political as well. And there's so much noise and um, it's so important to have that that ground, being able to stay grounded in, in such a in such a crazy industry is so important. And to have um, this kind of uh, sort of um, mission brought by DJs, I think that's that's extremely powerful. Um, I'd love to know, like. Do you have any um, or, or who are your go to artists for when you, you know, when you when you want to get into a more Zen state of mind? Oh, ACDC. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Like just doing this in my head for like an hour. <laughs> amazing. I don't think of anything else, just the headache. Um, I mean, within our roster, I, I'd say in the All Day Dream roster, self-promotion, mm -hmm. um, Powell and Pippi Sears both have uh, done some amazing albums because at the, because there's there are threads between their music and to me it's about the consistency of things. So if I put on an album like this, I'll find myself listening to it three times without noticing I'm listening to it. Mm. But there's also something about the sounds they use, the softness um, of the beats, uh, you know, the the lack of intensity in the percussion at that volume however if you go out you know you turn them up it's different but uh yeah i mean paul and pippi just make such beautiful music that just is hypnotizing to me amazing well we'll definitely uh link that into the um the show notes of this uh of this interview lee what do you think is perhaps one of the biggest misconceptions of underground electronic music or the dance industry as, as a whole that talent is measured in social media numbers. Um, so from the outside looking in, if you don't know so much about it, the popularity, you know, cause I mean, we, we, you know, we can go out today and buy that sort of popularity. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, there's so much talent there and they're not getting booked because the promoter's looking at, oh, you only have, you know, 2000, followers on Instagram, you know, and, it, and, and the, the work itself, the art itself, the music itself, the DJ sets themselves are not really given the uh, recognition they deserve. You know, it's just, a, it's just a sale point, mm. which is a little bit sad. No, thank you so much for saying that. Um, I, I just couldn't agree, agree more. And it's, yeah, it's, it should be quality over quantity um, rather than the other way around. And some in this overly sort of um, how much information we get fed on a daily basis it, yeah I guess people sometimes promoters don't don't take those risks unfortunately but um, yeah so talking about um, All Day I Dream I'm just curious to know um, how many people are sort of involved in the whole label and um, and I'm aware that some of them are you know naturally I'm sure have become your close friends so like how do you find the whole sort of like um, work-life balance between friends as well in a professional setting? Uh, I mean, the label itself, luckily, I, I, initially I tried to run it on my own, which was where, if you look back at the release schedule <laughs> in the first two years, it's really all over the place. Uh, but I have a wonderful guy called Philip who, yes, has become a friend over time, um, who used to run uh, Minus, I think, for Richie um, and sort of branched out and took on some other labels. And so he looks after myself. He looks after Afterlife. Mm. Um, and he ex knows what he's doing, you know, and, and the one thing I've learned uh, in business, because I'm not particularly an amazing businessman, uh, first and foremost, you know, I've learned along the way is to delegate and to trust and to find the right people. So luckily, Philip is, uh, you know, fabulous at running the label. The events themselves, they're, these are a lot more complex. So we have a bigger team um, just to run the overall brand. Uh, ranging from you know a dedicated social media person 
to uh, the event management, like in the broader scale globally. And then uh, the team on the ground is just amazing building the events. So I actually haven't not, uh, totted up how many people are working for me, but um, I like I like the personal touch as well, not to be, you know, in my ivory tower, looking down, pointing, saying, do this, do that for me. Uh, because actually when we started the events, I was also carrying the speakers up the stairs to the roof and eventually it was them that told me I didn't need to do that anymore and I should just mm -hmm. be the, the talent. So either I'm not very good at carrying speakers or they didn't want me, you know, pulling my back. Exactly. Um, but no, I, I, I actually really enjoy getting to know people because it's, it's important to me that the energy of anybody doing anything for myself um, or the brand, it has to be the right, they have to be the right person. You know, they have to have the right sentiment and it's not just a job, you know, because I, I like people to actually enjoy what they do. I think, you know, they're, they're, they're gonna do a better job if they're not sort of dragging their heels to work in the, in the morning being like, Ugh, I hate this work environment. What else can I do? So, of course. And there's probably a lot more other people that would want their jobs. <laughs> Um, talking about, uh, you know, pulling the back and stuff, how do you take care of your health as an artist? I take a lot of baths. Because, um, <laughs> uh, you know, there's something about getting older that, you know, just, I, I'm actually fine. I, you know, I, I try to run. I, I was doing Pilates a lot, but um, COVID kind of shut all the studios. And, and then I actually haven't, still haven't gravitated back to doing it because I've been traveling around not really based anywhere, but uh, obviously meditation. Um, again, I wish I could say I do it on a daily basis, but it's a little intermittent sometimes, uh, but I maybe three, four times a week uh, if I'm patchy, you know, otherwise mm -hmm. better. Um, I try to stretch in the morning. Uh, and, and also I think it's finding a balance between the amount of gigs I get offered and not just saying yes to everything. I used to say, uh, you know, yes to everything and be bouncing around. And that's what I was saying earlier about quality of life, trying to actually, you know, take a weekend off where that that really gives you two weeks without going to an airport, sitting on a plane, changing time zone. And so just being more aware of uh, my, my sort of limits. I, I only go 25% over my limits nowadays. I don't go 50 to 100% over my, over my limit. Nice. I had a, a Japanese friend once who told me that the secret to longevity in Japan is taking a bath every day. <laughs> um, <laughs> so on on the right, hopefully the right note there. Um, something we're talking about offline um, or off air, sorry, was that we're both Scorpios. I'm curious to know what 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 do you think being what 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 does being a Scorpio mean to you? Like, do you see that in yourself? I see some of the traits and. Um... I think there's, there, there are some negative ones. Like we sort of hold everything below the surface and um, only when it sort of boils over to, you know, it, it, you sort of, if you're scorned, that's it, we cut these people off and we're never going to speak to them again. <laughs> but it takes quite a lot. I, I feel like that's more the Scorpios towards the end of the month rather than the beginning of the month, apparently, because like, I have a few Scorpio friends. But um, aren't we dark, mysterious, sexy? <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> Um, I, th I think more so the the holding things inside you know not I, I'm trying to be better at communicating in mm -hmm. general because mm -hmm. I think that's a, a definitive Scorpio trait that I was that was creating issues in my life actually mm. you know it's easier to share man <laughs> interesting um the imagery and aesthetic of all day I dream is is uh, you know heavily themed on clouds and I love that each EP has a different cloud so it's so cool um so but naturally obviously the name brings <clears throat> to mind the act of like you know gazing at the sky and getting lost in the in the clouds so uh, do you do you visualize things um do you visualize music does that does that sort of play any role in in you as a as a person as an artist I, I wish I actually like for me I've always had to work with much more talented people than myself I didn't come from a production uh background you know sort of slowly learned along the way so I feel like I work with people that visualize music more so than um, myself, but I, I actually dream a lot of things. And I've had some crazy voice notes at times where I've thought of melody that I thought was great or I thought was original. <laughs> Mostly it was neither, you know, it was either I'm just hearing another song that exists that I've remembered somehow in my subconscious 
or it's just absolute nonsense. Um, but I have come up with a lot of other creative ideas by waking up and scribbling. You know, a lot of the the decor and the design and the, the events came from deep sleep, actually. So really, uh, I'm not sort of a uh, what's it called? Wool, is it called wool gazing? I think you know when you sort of sit daydream and stuff. Um, yeah, I, I, I used to sit in a field as a kid in Dorset and imagine what my life would be. Uh, but again, didn't nail it quite as well as uh, it's turned out. But I wish I could visualize music, but it's not my it's not my uh, skill set, unfortunately. What What did you used to sort of um, think your life would be when you were when you were a young boy in Dorset? Occasionally, I would see a plane flying over. Maybe one day I would go somewhere. <laughs> that was an exciting <laughs> thought over and over. Be careful wow. what you wish. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, thick and fast now. <laughs> um, so we're moving into our audience Q&A. We've got two questions that we've selected from our listeners. Um, and we'll start with Sean from Detroit, who says, um, as you're actually just talking to about there, you've been open in the past about preferring to DJ um, than, let's say, producing music. Um, what triggers your creativity in when you face mental blocks in the studio? Is there anything that you like to do to kind of get back in the zone? Uh, step away, actually, I think, and, and start working on something else. Uh, it's very easy to get caught up in the loop over and over and over and not know which direction to go. So just actually starting a whole new project and then coming back fresh the next day. Uh, that's usually pretty uh, pretty efficient. Mm. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Um, Naya from Kenya asks, uh, what's your biggest fear while performing, if you have any? Usually in a dream, they're, they're, they're seven inch records and they constantly run out and <laughs> I can't keep up. It's, it's actually a, a dream that I have had so many times oh my in my life. And I think it's actually a fear of losing control. Mm. Uh, but when I'm actually performing, I, I used to get really nervous. Uh, I think it's just about standing up in front of people and that kind of passed um, through just doing it so many times, but I kind of miss the feeling because it's actually that if you can get a hold of that sort of nervousness, mm. it channels into, um, yeah, really interesting places. Mm. But I don't really get so nervous anymore. I think the last time I got nervous was the first time I played in Berlin in Panorama Bar. And I think the expectation in my mind of what people expect kind of got to me. Uh, but then I decided, okay, I've just got to do what I do. That's why they booked me. And again, it was, it was okay. Yeah, definitely. How interesting. Um, so we're going to move on to our quick fire round. Before we do, I just want to ask if there's anything I haven't asked you that you'd like me to that you'd like to share. Um, or yeah. No, I think we we pretty much covered absolutely everything. Fantastic. Um, okay, so quick fire round, um, not more than like 60 seconds on each question. Um, so what was the first gig you ever went to? The first gig I ever went to, as in a mm -hmm. DJ gig? Oh, it could be um it could be oh, you know, my DJ yeah. gig. <laughs> no, just um just any uh, I, I went to I went to see Dire Straits playing in a sheep and cow yard where they, they sell animals, uh which is in the countryside, but they also do concerts. Okay, interesting. <laughs> um <laughs> okay, uh number two, what are you most looking forward to about the um the coming winter months? I love wearing jackets. I, I own so many jackets. I don't I don't own many trousers but jackets so nowadays long jackets because of lack of trousers <laughs> what's your yin and what's your yang Oof, that's tough uh pass i don't know what my okay yin, uh, what's okay. yours oh my, mine's easy mine's my yin is music my yang is racing <laughs> nice <laughs> i'll come back to that one Okay. Okay. We'll come back to that one. Um, do you have a relationship by the way with music and driving just out of curiosity? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's the best place to listen to music. Hmm. Um, and you know, that you end up driving 300 miles further, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good track. I thought you were going to say 300 miles per hour and I got really excited there for a oh, second. No, no. I mean, if I could, I would, but you know, unfortunately, <laughs> that's kind of illegal. <laughs> Depends where you are. <laughs> um, if past lives were real, um, do you believe you might've had any? And if so, what? Or who would it have been? I definitely think past lives are real. Um, and I think a lot of the time, the dreams and fears we have 
um, manifest through something that's coming back up. So I definitely was a DJ in, in Henry VIII court rather than Jester. Um, I, was, I was definitely a caveman, but I was playing great beats with the club. Um, and hopefully I was, all the other times I was a girl because I'd actually much rather be a girl than a guy. <laughs> um, what's the best advice you've ever been told? It's better to be pissed off, pissed on than pissed off. No, pissed off than pissed on. <laughs> I'm not sure what the phrase is. Uh, no, the best advice I've ever been given is actually uh, don't get frantic. There's no point in it. It's a complete waste of energy. Mm. Yeah, mind over matter, right? Mm -hmm. um, what genre of music other than electronic um, has been most influential to you? 80s pop music, when synthesizers first came into the mainstream. Mm. Okay, interesting. Um, so we've got the final one. So before we do, any thoughts on the yin and yang? uh ooh, chocolate and yogurt okay okay then um <laughs> uh, what are you most grateful for um this month and i know the month's only just begun so maybe we can talk about last month the fact that we're able to be a community in public again mm. yeah definitely feels feels good to be uh seeing people in real life again Mm -hmm. absolutely well lee thank you so much for your time it's been uh it's been hilarious it's been a really good chat and um you know a lot of interesting thoughts and um and insights that you shared with us so thanks for being so open and honest as well um oh, yeah, pleasure thank really you for having appreciate me. it and uh, thank all, you absolutely all the best take care bye if you want to grab a copy of today's show notes, then head over to missionmakers.com forward slash Lee Burridge, where you'll also find notes from all of our previous episodes. I hope you've enjoyed this season as much as we've enjoyed having these conversations. I want to say a huge thank you to Lee and all of our guests for sharing their time and invaluable insights with this special Mission Makers community. We'll be taking a little break over the next month and then coming back with some really interesting bonus content from Davos in Switzerland. So be sure to share the show with your friends and subscribe to us on Apple, Spotify, YouTube and wherever else you listen to your podcasts. In the meantime, you can reach out to me at missionmakers or at dj.n1nja on Instagram. And if you're interested in supporting the show and getting some really cool rewards like virtual DJ lessons and exclusive merchandise, don't forget to visit patreon.com forward slash missionmakers. Thank you for listening and until next time, keep it laser focused. <laughs>